Hello. Sorry, everybody, for the delay. Just a little mix-up on the slides. My name is Ryan Castillo, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the market for rare earth elements with a presentation titled Made in China 2025 from Foreign Sources of Rare Earth Supply. Who, when, and where? I'll skip over this to save some time, but I'll take a moment to quickly tell you a little bit more about who we are and what we do for anyone who's not entirely familiar. We are an independent research and advisory firm that I founded in 2012 to help clients make informed decisions involving strategic metals and minerals. Our clients include exploration and mining companies, institutional investors, government agencies, as well as other advisory firms. Despite being a relatively young company, we have clients on six continents and offices on two. Lastly, before I jump into the content, please note that this presentation will contain forecasts and forward-looking statements related to future events that are not necessarily certain, so please keep that in mind. On that note, I'll kick off the presentation with an overview of two important strategic initiatives that are currently underway in China that will fuel a surge in rare earth demand in the years to come. In May of 2015, China's Ministry of Industry and Information Technology unveiled the Made in China 2025 initiative. Essentially, it's a 10-year plan to transform China from a low-tech manufacturing giant specialized in parts assembly and integration into a high-tech manufacturing superpower, the likes of Germany, South Korea, and Japan. A key facet of this initiative is a goal to raise the domestic content of core components and materials used in manufacturing to 40% by 2020 and 70% by 2025. This will translate to strong demand growth for certain rare earth elements, particularly those used in permanent magnets, which are used in a vast array of different parts and components motors and actuators, sensors and controls, and other end uses and applications. The second initiative currently underway in China is what we like to call the Spent in China 2025 initiative. Essentially, a fun or fundamentally a policy-driven transformation of the nation's economy from one that's reliant on manufacturing and exports to an economy that is increasingly driven by services and domestic spending and consumption. As we can see in both of these charts on the screen, over the past few decades, the contribution of manufacturing to top-line GDP in China has gradually declined. But at the same time, the contribution of services to GDP in China has increased steadily. So, by all means, the transformation to a services-led economy is well underway. And we now expect to see domestic consumption making a growing contribution to China's GDP. This will translate to strong demand, oh, strong demand for a long list of consumer appliances, devices, electronics, and other products that use rare earth elements. In combination, we believe that the Made in China and Spent in China 2025 initiatives will fuel a surge in demand for rare earth permanent magnets. And this will affect applications spanning industrial, urban, residential, and consumer applications. So on that note, let's take a look at how we see supply and demand unfolding in China for the next few years, and particularly supply and demand of didymium oxide, also known as NDPR oxide, which is the key input material for neodymium iron boron magnets. In a major market study that we published recently, we forecast that China's demand for didymium oxide will increase at a compound annual growth rate of almost 10% through 2025, reaching 57,700 tons. Over the same period, based on production guidance issued by China's relevant ministries, we forecast that production will increase to just 47,800 tons, resulting in the depletion of historically accumulated inventories 
and ultimately shortages if global production is not ramped up fast enough to support rising demand. To offset this growing imbalance between supply and demand, we estimate or forecast that imports into China will rise steadily through 2025, be it imports of mineral concentrate from rainbow rare earths in Burundi, imports of chemical concentrate from Northern Minerals or Hastings in Australia, or from a number of other advanced emerging producers currently on the horizon, as I'll discuss more in a few moments. Lastly, from 2017 through 2025, we forecast that exports of didymium oxide will decrease steadily as buyers in Japan and elsewhere increasingly source from Linus in Australia and other emerging suppliers. So if we take those four charts that we saw on the previous slide and combine them into one, as we see now, we can see that imports are poised to rise as China increasingly sources from emerging suppliers we can see that exports are poised to fall as buyers in Japan and the rest of the world increasingly buy from Linus in Australia and other emerging producers. And the culmination of these trends is that by 2020, we expect that China will become a net importer of didymium oxide. And by 2025, a growing imbalance between domestic supply and demand will leave China increasingly reliant on imports from abroad. So where exactly will those imports come from? When will these, when will these uh, new producers start production? And yeah, who, what, and when, where? Um, essentially, I don't think anybody knows the answer to this question with 100% certainty. But after following the exploration and development space very closely for the past five years, we're beginning to see glimpses of who those near-term suppliers may be. Outside of China, there are 38 advanced rare earth projects globally at various stages of pre-production development. Two of the projects, as we can see on the far right, have commenced mine development. Those are Brown's Range in Australia and the Gakara project in Burundi, both of which we believe will become near-term suppliers into China. Rainbow Rare Earths, the owner of the Gakara project in Burundi that I mentioned a moment ago, is aiming to start production in the fourth quarter of 2017, so basically any day. The company is planning to produce a high-grade mineral concentrate, which we believe will be sold into China. Similarly, Northern Minerals, owner of the Browns Range project in Australia, is aiming to start production in 2018, small-scale production, and has recently announced an agreement to sell a mixed rare earth carbonate to JF Meg in China. Similarly, Hastings Technology Metals, who is also active in Australia, has announced a number of agreements to sell mixed rare earth carbonate to buyers in Japan within recent months. Beyond the scope of these emerging producers, it's also believed that Linus, Australian rare earth miner, has witnessed growing demand for its rare earth products from Chinese buyers in recent years, and we expect that that demand level will continue to rise through 2025. Beyond the scope of traditional exploration projects, there are also a number of companies looking to exploit unconventional rare earth supply sources, be it from mineral sands, tailings, or industrial waste streams. Two companies at the forefront of this space are Medallion Resources and Rare Earth Salts. Medallion is focused on a low-cost, low-risk business model centered on recovering monazite from existing waste streams. The company is focused on opportunities in the middle of the value chain between mining and separation of individual oxides. Rare Earth Salts, on the other hand, is focused on the end of the value chain, the processing and separation part, making it a logical partner or a suitor for a company uh, like Rare Earth Salts. Or making, uh, yeah. Beyond these companies, there's a number of other emerging processing companies worldwide with novel, environmentally friendly, cost-effective technologies, two of whom, Inord and Retec, are currently producing small quantities of rare earth compounds and are aiming to increase production in the near term. 
So as we have seen, the competitive landscape of potential rare earth producers is broad, and the projects themselves, despite being so-called rare earth projects, are actually quite different from one to the next. So just how can we tell which projects will be successful in reaching production? Is there perhaps some magic formula that we can use to quantify the likelihood of success? Well, I personally don't believe that there is, and the reason, quite frankly, is that analyzing rare earth projects is an inexact science. It's a science that is riddled with qualitative and subjective variables that are arguably important, but ultimately contribute to just one thing, and that is cost. Cost to produce a kilogram of saleable product. There's a common saying in the resources sector that you're likely familiar with, and that is, cost is king. And that's generally true. A company that produces an ounce of gold at the lowest cost reaps the biggest profits. A company that produces a pound of copper at the lowest cost makes more money than its peers. But in the rare earth space, because the value of each producer's output differs, cost may be king, but profit margins are his master. So, in other words, rare earth projects do not compete on cost the way traditional mining companies do. They compete on profit margins. And I'll explain. Shown on the slide is a cost curve, showing the projected production cost and product value of the advanced projects we looked at earlier. Each blue box on the chart represents a project. The height of each blue box indicates the projected cost to produce a kilogram of rare earth oxide. The width of each blue box indicates how many tons of rare earth oxide each project plans to produce annually. The orange line that we see on the chart indicates the product value attributed to each project based on current rare earth and co-product prices. The key takeaway here from this slide is that being a so-called low-cost producer of rare earths does not necessarily mean you are the most profitable among your peers. And in fact, it doesn't even mean that you'll be profitable at all. We can see a number of higher-cost projects on the cost curve with potential to earn substantial profit margins. So I think it's fair to conclude from this that in the rare earth space, cost is not necessarily king. Shown on this slide, instead of plotting a cost curve, we've plotted a profit margin curve. So in other words, instead of plotting each project's absolute production cost in dollars per kilogram, we've instead plotted each project's production cost as a percentage of product value, effectively normalizing the value of each project's output to 100%, as shown by the horizontal orange line. The key takeaway here, before I wrap up my presentation, is that at current rare earth prices, there are a number of projects globally, including Commerce Resources, who we will hear from next, with potential to earn a healthy pre-tax profit margin, suggesting that there is indeed a real financial incentive to develop new rare earth mines outside of China. As long as rare earth prices stay strong over the long term, which we believe they will, then we believe that a number of the projects we reviewed today will ultimately be developed. If you would like some more information about the topics that we discussed here today, or if you'd like to get uh, access to detailed information, metrics, and costs on each project, then I highly recommend you subscribe for our Project Profiles publication. The monthly or quarterly report contains a wealth of up-to-date uh, costs, metrics, information on each project that we track. Each five-page project profile um, will essentially provide you with all the metrics you need to conduct due diligence on any potential investment interests. So if you have any questions about this or anything else we discussed today, please feel free to speak with me off stage, or I welcome you to contact me by phone or email at your convenience. Thank you very much for your time and attention.